Top of the morning to you. Morning. You ever been with somebody that you liked, you considered a, a good friend or a family member that you loved, you know, somebody you liked being with, and you could tell they weren't really with you. They're physically in the presence of you. They might even be sitting at the same table with you, but perhaps they're a little distracted by their phone. Have you seen that? People, it's even the same family, all sitting at a, a restaurant and everybody's around the table, but everybody's got their face in their phone and they're not really looking at each other or talking to each other. Uh, I call that distracted love. It, and it doesn't really work. Uh, especially if you're trying to have like the romantic kind of date thing for Valentine's Day. You know, can you imagine sitting at the table with somebody you're trying to be romantic with and they go, wait a minute, I need to check this text. Uh, that's distracted, it really doesn't work. I want to talk to you this morning about undistracted love. First, how we love God. Now, God's love for us is always undistracted. Nothing bothers God. He doesn't have an iPhone. He doesn't get text messages. He doesn't get, you know, the 3,000 emails a day that we get. He's not bombarded with all that spam. God never sleeps. He doesn't get tired. He's always happy to be with us. And he's always happy when we give him our attention because we don't usually give him very much of our attention. So when we give it to him, he's really happy. And if I see that phone again, I'm going to take it away, sir. <laughs> Thank you for that spontaneous live demonstration. Thank you. That was perfect, Jim. That was perfect. I paid him to do that. That was good. God wants our love, but he wants it freely. He's not going to poke you over the head or beat you around the shoulders to get you to pay attention to him or give him your love. If you want to spend all your day with your face in your phone, God will let you do that. But he is hungry for your love, if I can use that expression. And he wants your undistracted love. And he wants us to love each other the same way. So he wants us to be able to love each other freely, by our free wills, but undistracted. If you're going to spend time with each other, serving each other, being kind to each other, helping load groceries, you, you don't want to do that in an undistracted manner, right? That wouldn't be safe to start with. So let's focus this morning on maybe one or two tips from God to help us Live with a more undistracted love. First, it helps if you can see clearly. Uh, I wear glasses, and I notice that I frequently have to wash them. Otherwise, I can't see out of them. They're useless. I get dirt on these things without even trying to. So having clear lenses helps me see. And I like to see you in your smiling face. So if you're going to help somebody, you really want to load the groceries into the right car. You want to see clearly, right? So how do we see clearly? Matthew 7, 5 says, and this is Jesus talking, remove the log from your own eye. What's he talking about? Well, we, all human beings, doesn't matter what country you're born in or raised in, all human beings around the world, they're very quick to judge each other. And Jesus is teaching in this moment in, in Matthew 7, don't do that. Stop it. All of us deal with enough guilt and grief and shame. We don't need to add to that by judging one another. And yet, this is one of our worst habits. Okay, let's just put that out there. We're all bad at this. Or perhaps I should say, we're all really good at this. Right? So let's repent from that sin and stop judging each other. Let's begin there and, and remove the log from our own eye. Because before you can pick on your sister or brother and how bad they are, and all the things they do wrong, let's just look in the mirror. Let's check ourselves out and see all the things we do wrong, right? Oh, no, 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 no. I feel too much guilt when I do that. Too much shame. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Ooh, well, Jesus says start there. Start with yourself. As a matter of fact, you can write this in, in the margin there. Start with Psalm 51. Why don't you pray Psalm 51 every day? Because you ask God to search you by his Holy Spirit and see if there's any sin at all 
inside your heart or mind, your soul, and cleanse you, cleanse you from everything. That's what 1 John talks about. 1 John says in chapter 1, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse, cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So you first have to confess your sin before God will cleanse you of your sin. So let's begin with ourselves, removing the logs from our own eyes. Let's deal with our own junk, our own garbage. And then, Matthew 6, forgive others. Forgive ourselves and forgive others. Every single day. Forgiveness is inexhaustible. The disciples later asked Jesus in another part of the Gospels, well, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive this you know, jerk of a brother-in-law that I really hate his guts and he's just always annoying the heck out of me? How many times? Forever. Seven times 70. 70 times 70 times 700. 70 times 70 times 700 times 7,000. Just keep going. Forgiveness never ends. Do you know why it never ends? Do you know why God's forgiveness never ends? Because God is infinite. His love is infinite. He never stops loving. He never stops forgiving. There's no end to God's forgiveness. And he's telling us, if we're going to love, we love like he loves. We forgive like he forgives. And so there's no end to it. And you go, wait a minute, Pastor Steve. You don't know my neighbor. Yeah, I do. We've all got that neighbor. We've all got that neighbor. We've all got that coworker. We've all got that classmate, that, that one person that literally drives everybody on the planet nuts. That person, yeah, we've all got that neighbor or friend or relative, right? Forgive. Leave them in God's hands. Pray for them. Love them as Jesus loves them. As a matter of fact, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. We're going to do this together. We almost never do this. We're going to pray a prayer together. So I'm going to invite you to stand. Go ahead, stand up. We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. I know. We should maybe do this every Sunday. Jesus said, pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, you can have a seat now. But there's that one phrase in verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then he goes on to teach that if you don't forgive, God is not going to forgive you. Just let that sink in for a bit. In one of the previous churches I was a pastor in, there was a, a family in the church that I love. Sure, and I got to be good friends with them. We hung out with them, uh, did things outside the church with them. Cool family, right? But the patriarch of the family, the gentleman of the family, the older guy, the, the, the grandpa of the family, who walked with the Lord his whole life, didn't forgive. And he literally told me one day, we're having a conversation, he tells me to my face, I will never forgive this person. And I'm looking, I'm like, really? Let's pray the Lord's Prayer again together. Because if you don't forgive, you're not being forgiven. I don't want to stand next to you when the lightning hits. We have to forgive others if we want the forgiveness of Jesus ourselves. That's the bottom line. So seeing clearly means remove the log from our own eye and forgiving others. And please pray Psalm 51 and, and pray the Lord's Prayer every day. Just before you go to work, when you come home from work. <laughs> Maybe you need it more when you come home, right? Had that tough day with people in the world. So we need to see clearly and then we need to speak words of delight. Now, how often do you remember somebody speaking to you words of delight? Words that just made your heart sing. Does that happen very often? That somebody just speaks to you and just makes your day by what they say? Does that happen very often? I see people shaking their heads no. I think... 
Jesus wants us as his children to be those people that speak his words of love and kindness, his words of peace and blessing. I think people in the world are dying for more peace and blessing from God. And he's given us those words to speak. We don't need to go around condemning people for their sins. Believe it or not, that's the Holy Spirit's job, not ours. But do people need words of peace and blessing and kindness? Yes! All of our hearts are hungry for this. So let's, let's begin focusing on how we can speak words of delight to others. What is the greatest desire of your soul? Psalm 119, verse 76. You don't have to turn there, but if you like to, Psalm 119, verse 76. For those of you that don't remember, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the Bible. Starting verse 76. Oh, may thy loving kindness, this is David's song of love to God. Oh, may thy loving kindness, O oh Lord, comfort me according to thy word, the Bible, to thy servant. May thy compassion come to me that I may live. For thy law, thy word is my delight. And he goes on to keep singing about this. The whole psalm. Psalm 119, longest psalm in the Bible. It's just David's love song to God. The greatest desire of David was God's word being spoken to him, coming to him, giving him life, giving him joy. That is David's greatest delight. Do you listen to and treasure God's word in your heart? Psalm 119 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. Thy word I have treasured in my heart that I may, that I may not sin against thee. Do you treasure God's word in your heart? That's the only way that our lives will be transformed, that our thinking will be transformed. If you're listening to the, the news on TV or radio, if you're watching television, you're not getting information from God. Now, I'm not being critical of anything you're watching. I'm just letting you know God did not make that show you're watching on TV. And so you're getting a message from the world. You're not getting a message from God. Is it going to bless your heart? Is it going to make you more godly? Listen to and treasure God's word in your hearts. And now, after you've got your greatest desire being God and his word, and you're listening to and treasuring his word, then, then you can speak words of life-giving love. But if you're going to want to speak God's word, if you're going to want to speak words of delight to other people, where do those words come from? It's not a trick question. God! So if you're not getting words from him, what do you have to share with other people? You got nothing. You've got to have God's word treasured in your heart to share God's word. You have, you have to have God's love filling you in order to share God's love with people. So we need to see clearly, we need to speak clearly, and the only way we can do this is if we have God's word in our heart. As a matter of fact, in the Gospels, Jesus tells us that what comes out of our heart either delights or defiles. If what comes out of your heart is words of anger and frustration and impatience and, you know, those four-letter nasty things, if that's what's coming out of your mouth, then that's what's in your heart. If you're stuck in traffic and somebody cuts off in front of you because you know, they want to get that three-inch space that's in front of you and they, they're going to pull into that with their 16-foot you know, pickup truck, uh, maybe you might feel a little tension in that moment. But if you've been living with your eyes focused on God, if you've had your heart treasuring his word, if you've been actually praying, Lord, make me more like you, make me more patient, more kind, then when this situation happens, God's going to bless that prayer, that desire of your heart, and he's going to give you that peace and that patience. When the world around you seems to be going crazy, in the rain, 
you can have peace and patience. And you can speak words of love instead of words of hate. Amen? See clearly, speak words of delight. And then, if you're going to have undistracted love, you have to actually make it physical. Now, when you talk about physical love in the world, they're talking about sex. And that's not what God's talking about. That's not what God wants us to focus on. That's the world's ways, not God's way. Making love physical means doing everything as loving as Jesus did. Now, I know you've all been to a wedding. You've all heard this section, but I'm going to read it again. 1 Corinthians 13. But I want you to think in terms of Jesus ministering. Jesus actually walking around Israel, walking around Galilee, walking around Jerusalem, and healing the blind and literally touching lepers that nobody touched. As I read 1 Corinthians 13, think of Jesus physically loving people. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. Jesus never did that. Huh? He never acted unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Jesus didn't do that. It's not provoked. And the Pharisees tried to provoke him continually. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice with unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things, even the cross. Love never fails. Undistracted love is the love of God. It's the love of Jesus for you and every sinner. It means that if we're going to live like Jesus lived, if we're going to follow Jesus, then we love other people the way Jesus loves other people. With an undistracted love that just gives of self. And it means making love for others, even a total stranger, more important than our own business. Every single one of us is busy. Every single one of us has a schedule that's a little too full. Every one of us. I mean, it's almost like we try to, and every single day we, we try to pack 10 pounds of things into a five pound sack. And we wonder why we're so tired. God wants us to make loving others a daily priority by making time, by stopping some of the things we do, even our normal work. Jesus gave the story. We call the story the Good Samaritan, which is really ironic because in Jesus' day, there wasn't a single Jew in Israel that thought one Samaritan was good. Every Samaritan to a Jew was lower than a dog. And they didn't like dogs. They looked at dogs like you and I look at vultures. Stinky carrion eaters. Right? Anybody here have a vulture for a pet? No. And that's how Jews looked at dogs. They just ate you know, dead things. They were carrion eaters like vultures. And so if you consider a Samaritan lower than a dog, pfft, you're pretty low on the totem pole in people's eyes. And yet Jesus lifted a Samaritan to be the hero of the story, right? Jewish guy is on a trip, gets beat up and robbed, left for dead. Priest comes by, ignores him. Levi comes by, ignores him. Samaritan comes by and stops. Bandages his wounds, puts him on his own donkey, carries him into a, a town, into a bed and breakfast, puts him in the inn, pays the innkeeper, gives him instruction to help, you know, nurse him back to health, and he says, look, whatever this guy owes you, I'll pay him my way back. Can you imagine giving an innkeeper your credit card? Say, I'll pay for this other guy's, I'll pay for this guy's you know, whole bill when I come back through. Whatever he owes you, I'll pay it. That's love. Taking care of somebody you don't even know. 
making love physical. I've given you some verses here in Luke 10, 1 John, Matthew 25. At the end of all this world, there's going to be a great judgment. You want to know what the last thing is? The last thing is the great judgment, as far as this world's concerned. And every single person is going to stand before God. And he's, Jesus says in, in Matthew 25, he's going to separate people, all people, into two groups, goats and sheep. Sheep are his, people that have followed Jesus by faith, and the goats are everybody else. The goats were religious in Jesus' story, but they didn't love Jesus. They didn't follow Jesus. The sheep followed Jesus, loved Jesus, but they didn't mention a single religious thing in order to get into heaven. Jesus says, you gave a cup of cold water to someone who was thirsty. You helped clothe someone who was naked. You helped feed someone who was starving. Come, enter heaven with me. That was it. You know what's interesting? We get all hung up on correct doctrine and theology. We say, oh, you've got to pray this prayer, this, you've got to pray these words this way, and you know, then you've got to walk down the aisle, and then you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. Jesus didn't do any of that. He said, you have to love the hurting and the needy. That's it. All of us need to make our love for God physical if we're going to have undistracted love. And the only way we can do this is by helping people, our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members, our classmates, the homeless, the addicted, the lost, love them physically. And then how do we keep doing this day in and day out? Well, we make our own heart and mind pure and faithful by first remembering to give thanks in all things. Psalm 77 and Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 20 are beautiful. I, I encourage you to read these verses this coming week. But remember to always give thanks. If you've had a bad day or a bad week, and, and that happens, okay, our circumstances aren't always rosy, are they? But even in a bad day, even in a bad week, there are things for all of us to give thanks for. Count them. Name them. Thank God for them. Start counting the people in your life. You'll probably come up with a long list. And you'll probably come up with some names of people that perhaps you've been neglecting a little bit, haven't been showing a lot of love to lately. And you'll be reminded by the Holy Spirit of all the different ways those people have loved you, blessed you, helped you, been kind to you. Remember and give thanks. And then, according to Psalm 119, verses 1 through 11, learn and do and keep and walk in and give thanks for God's word. God's word is life to your bones. God's word is healing. God's word is restoring. God's word is the foundation for your being. God's word is the light unto your path. God's word is supernaturally powerful in ways you can't even imagine. By a word, God spoke and created the heavens and the earth. By a word. God's word is power. It is life. Treasure God's word in your mind, in your heart. And then in all these things, by giving thanks, by learning and doing and keeping God's word, we are transformed. Be transformed completely holy. Do you have the goal? Is, is this on your to-do list? Be holy. Most people don't list that. And yet it is a command, Old Testament and New Testament, were to be exactly like God. Be holy. It's an absolute command. And there's no second tier. You know what I mean? There's no plan B here. God doesn't say, be holy, except, you know, Monday morning when you don't feel like it. There's no escape clause with God as far as being holy is concerned. Being holy is it. 
if we want communion with God, if we actually want to experience Jesus Christ and know him intimately, then it is required of us to be holy exactly like he is holy. And the only way to do that is to humble ourselves, repent daily. By repenting daily, it doesn't mean you have to walk the center aisle of the church again. It means that you turn from your ways and you turn and reorient your thinking and reorient your emotions, reorient your desires to center on Jesus and him alone. There's a million things that distract us. And maybe, maybe there's only a million things that distract me. Maybe you've only got ten things that distract you. Maybe it's only ten for you. I, I find my thoughts being distracted all the time, and I, I find myself wanting undistracted love more and more for Jesus. I don't want the world to get in the way. I don't want my sin nature to get in the way. I just want that pure, perfect, holy love from God and to God. And this is how we do it. He really did make it simple for us. Jesus taught all these things. Jesus lived all these things. We can see clearly. We can speak words of delight. We can make love physical. And we can make our hearts and minds pure and faithful. We can live a transformed holy life. We can do this because God gives us the ability. This is not a worldly thing. You're not going to get this message from CNN. You're not going to get it from ESPN. You're not going to get it from watching a Kings game. You're not going to get it from the news. And, and I'm not down on any of those things. Please understand me. I'm not critical of a single one of those things. But Jesus came to give us life, true life, and abundantly not as the world gives, but as God himself created. Perfect, undistracted. And he intends us to live that way with him forever. And he also intends for us to start that here and now. So what do you want? What do you want? Do you want undistracted love? Here's a few ways you can start. Pick one or two off your sermon notes, just pick one or two for this week and ask God to help you. Begin to live one or two of those things daily. Just do it daily. Start one new thing daily to love God more. Pray Psalm 51 in the morning. Read Matthew 25 at lunch. Just do something different. Add to your love with God. If you want his help to love more, Pray that. Jesus talked to a man, offered to heal his son, and the man said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right? All of us can pray that to Jesus. We say, Lord, I love you. Help me love you more. Help me love you undistracted. Wouldn't that be great? I want to give you a benediction. As you leave, as you go back into this world of craziness and the love of God, because God is everywhere, I want you to have this benediction. I actually got this from a guy named Caleb off of a Christian website. May the beauty of God be reflected in your eyes. May the love of God be reflected in your eyes. Hands. May the wisdom of God be reflected in your words. And the knowledge of God flow from your heart. May the peace of God flow from your complete being to be a blessing to every single person you touch. That the love of God would draw them to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Go in his peace and love. God bless you. He loves you.